Welcome to Stage Worthy. I'm Phil Rickaby, the host of this podcast. This is episode 326. Remember that Stage Worthy is a one person operation. So not only do I host the podcast, I also arrange the guests, I edit the show, promote it, and I even created the music that you're hearing right now. I also shoulder all of the financial responsibilities for keeping the show going. So if you enjoy this podcast, please consider supporting it. There are a few ways that you can do that. If you listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can leave a five-star rating. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, you can also leave a review at the same time. Those ratings and reviews help new people to find the show. If you want to keep up with what's going on with Stageworthy and my other projects, you can subscribe to my newsletter, which only goes out every couple of weeks or so, by going to philrickaby.com slash subscribe. And you can also leave a tip for the show by dropping some change in the virtual tip jar. You'll find a link to that in the show notes, which you can find on the website or in your podcast app. But one of the most important things you can do, even more important than even ratings or reviews or even financial support, is to share it on social media. Even retweeting this episode helps. You can find Stageworthy on Twitter and Instagram at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website with the archive of all 326 episodes at StageworthyPodcast.com. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Phil Rickaby, and as I mentioned, my website is PhilRickaby.com. My guest this week is Laura Pitchinen. Laura tells stories, whether as a dancer and aerialist, a playwright and performer in a musical or play, or as a comedian at Just for Laughs, or even as a teacher. Laura is presenting her show Lesbianist at the Toronto Fringe, as well as other fringes across Canada. Here's our conversation. What's the what's the name of the show that you're you're doing in the that you're touring for Fringe this year? It's called Lesbianist. Oh uh-huh, yes. yes. Well, you did that. You did. Uh, that was a virtual uh, uh, last Fringe, was it? Yeah. It, um, last Fringe, it went virtual, but mm. I instead did like a written piece entirely different, called called the Suicide Key, right? Um, because I really didn't want to perform this virtually it i need the audience i need the feedback i ended up doing for a, a gig virtually with an excerpt of this show a 15 mm-hmm. minute piece and it was just torture it it, it the, everybody yeah. politely turned off their mics and everything for mm-hmm. my performance but i had no feedback it's a comedy yeah it's, it's really like stand-up comedy in a storytelling like narrative, but it's it's like joke, joke, joke. And with mm. no feedback whatsoever, it was honestly painful and a new personal circle of hell for me. Um and and then everybody at the end was like, oh, that's so funny, yay, whatever. But it's so much better when people are live yeah. and engaging with each other and they hear the person next to them chuckling, and then it gives them permission to laugh a little bit louder and like feeding off of the audience, listening to them, what kind of jokes are they into? Yeah. What kind of what part of my voice do they really like? And like making those micro adjustments for each audience so that you're you're doing the best show for them. Anyway, yeah. it was I mean, it's better than no performance at all. And I was grateful sure. for the opportunity. And now I know those people and I'll, I'll invite them to the next um, <laughs> version, the live version, be like, guess what? This is going to be even better. <laughs> um, but that was like really, that was really hard. This has been the problem with with digital stuff is the fact that um, first off, there is no perfect performance streaming service, right? There's nothing right. that's like that like lets us really sort of. There have been a couple where that I've found where you can sort of the audience can sort of hear them when somebody goes up on stage. The audience is their their volume is automatically lowered, but you can still sort of hear a hum. The problem mm. is that there's still this lag. Mm. that you can't really do anything about. So you sort of, you'll, you'll hit your punchline and then it's dead and then you go on and then they hear the laugh, then the oh. laugh comes in. Right. And so it's yes. just, the rhythm is totally thrown off. There's no perfect streaming solution for, for performance. Right. And how do you ever overcome that? Because we've spent our entire lives learning how to listen and react so yeah. quickly yeah. to the audience. 
that to then wait like for a laugh track <laughs> or to talk over it, to ignore it entirely. Yeah. Well, then they're going to miss like the next part. That's the problem. And, and it's always like the 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 lag between punchline and the, the streamed audience reaction is long enough that you feel like an idiot just sort of yeah. sitting there in silence. Yeah. Hoping that laugh is ever going to come. Right. Right. I know. I felt like a total idiot in this doing this show. Like, <laughs> and anyway, <Yeah. laughs> like it, it ruined my flow because there should be a natural pause. Yeah in places where people laugh and then you stop, breathe, regroup, and then kind of change direction. But when there's nothing there, you really have to force a shift that, you know, and it it was just really, really hard. And again, everybody was generous and, but you know, people will tell you you've done a good job, even if you didn't do a good job. No, I know. You know? know, so it's hard to say if they really enjoyed it or they were just feeling like you did a thing, you know? I always feel like people, People aren't good at lying about this show. Like, yeah. if they didn't like it, they rarely say, I loved that. They'll no, say, but they're something. like, thank you so much. Yes. Great job. You know, what great something. energy you had or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Like, yeah. it's all typed in Zoom. They're not <laughs> saying it to me. So you can lie really well. In oh, text. sure. And they're yeah. like, gotta go. Thanks for the great evening. You were hilarious. Bye. Like, it, it, I hope they were real compliments, but I couldn't help but think like, how did you get that from what I just did? Because it felt so bad. I know when I'm on stage, if I've delivered a good performance, Mm -hmm. I know I feel good about it. Even if the audience, even no matter what the audience thinks, sometimes (laughs) I'm like, I did a good, that was good. And, um, but more or less, it's really, it's really about how the audience reacts. And then I just know, I know it was good. I don't need anyone to tell me afterwards that it was good. I heard it. Yeah. I heard them hear me, but who, yeah. So never again, but I'm glad I didn't, um, quote unquote, waste this show trying to do it virtually. And I've now bumped it. I got into fringe for 2020. Mm. So I've now bumped it for two years. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that. It looks like this year we're going to be able to fringe in yes. proper. Yeah. And they're even doing maybe a capacity limit, which mm. is good for me because I'm in the factory studio space. And I think it seats like 90 or mm-hmm. so- something like that, which is a lot to fill yeah. for fringe, the fringe run for a solo show. And so it'll be nice to, at least in my head, be like, well, it's going to be like 70% capacity. So even when it looks empty, it's it's full. And it, I, I can feel better about that. And yeah. then if they remove the cap, I'll just pretend it's still there. Yeah, there because, you go. Or maybe you will sell the hell out. That's you know, also a that possibility. Would be fantastic. You know, if everybody who hears about my show comes to see it, I would be thrilled. I am calling in all of my favors because I 100%. do wake up in the middle of the night going, nobody's going to be there. You know, that is yeah. the solar perfor- solo performer's nightmare, especially nightmare. when and it's it like. started two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> As, I it, like I was doing it. If it's the first time you're performing the show really live, you like. It, for me, the first time I performed my solo show was just like, I wanted to vomit the first day of the performance. Yeah. Like this is the first time like an audience is, isn't like close friends has ever seen it. And yeah. I spent the whole day on the verge of like, this could be the moment where I throw up, like just so, yeah. so nerve wracking. And then I did it and I was like, huh, that was good. Yeah. You know, I know. but like right up until then, you're just like, I could throw up. This is not going to go well. I did a 15 minute version of this at the Hamilton, Hamilton. I guess I did a 10 minute version there. And then I did, there was another queer on stage where I did a 15 minute version of this. And when I went to go do the 15 minute version, 15, I was like, I have never memorized 15 minutes of of a song, a solo show before. Like, I don't know if I'm going to remember this. And I really panicked about and then it's autobiographical. Like I yeah. know what happened in my own <laughs> life. I also know the order. So I don't know what I was so panicked about truly, but then I got on stage. It flew by. It went so well. And then I immediately got off stage and I ran to the script. I was like, I missed something. That was too easy. I, I missed something. And I didn't. And it was fine. <laughs> and it was totally fine. But now this is like three times longer. So I have the, the, the fear has not I didn't learn anything from that. And I, <laughs> I, I'm still afraid <laughs> that I'm not going to remember the order of the show and what I want to say. And now I've done it so that in like 
earlier on the show, I set up a joke or something. And then later I have to rely on myself to have set that up for (laughs) the punchline or for some sort of resolution. And that's what I'm most nervous about is that I could go up on stage and vamp for an hour easily. Mm -hmm. And, but what I want is a structured show that has that, you know, all good stand up comedy pieces uh, like the Netflix specials, they always the ending joke wraps something up so nicely. It always call is calls upon something earlier in the show, and those are my favorite ones because a you know it's the ending, so it it sits nicely as an mm-hmm. ending, and then people know the show is over even though they don't know what time it is and all that stuff. They mm-hmm. know, and so the worst thing is to that uh, instinct when the show is over to be like, and that's it. Like when you're in a presentation in high school, oh my school, god, you have to qualify the ending with, and we're done. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh my god, oh my god. There's nothing worse than like when the show ends, the lights go down, the show ends, and there's that pause before the lights go down. And right. The audience is kind of like, I don't know, is this just a pause? Was that is it? Show yeah. Is, like, yeah. <laughs> is this just a dramatic pause, or is this the end? And yeah. I want to avoid that. And also, isn't it cool when you wrap something up really good? It just Ooh, it feels good. And I Mm. thought I have to justify standing up here and talking about myself for 50 odd minutes. I'm saying the show's 50 minutes, but I actually haven't like really run through it at (laughs) speed. So I hope it's 50 minutes because they just asked today for us to tell them. Um, But I have to justify why I've been standing up here talking about myself for 50 minutes. There has to be an ending worth walking away going like, that was good. That was good. You know? It, 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 the ending really matters. It, yeah. it like it solidifies how people feel about the entire thing. So. One of the difficulties that I had in in like like the the like learning my show the first time was the fact that you know going into it I was like it's going to be a piece of cake. After all, <laughs> I wrote it, and then as I was like trying to do it, I was like, oh. You know, you use a different part of your brain for writing a thing than you do for learning a thing. Mm -hmm. And it I ended up having to like, it's so bad. It's so bad. I had to uh, uh, record myself. Yes. And listen to the show like you would if you were learning, like you Mm -hmm. listen to an album on repeat until I learned that. And then I could stop and then I'd be able to like deviate and perform it better. But just for the lines. Yeah. Just just for the lines. Yeah. I might do that too. My strategy for the 15 minute is to memorize the order of the paragraphs because I know the content pretty well. It's the order. So I would like, I would say, okay, brother paragraph, okay, uh, tree paragraph, Mm -hmm. okay, parent paragraph, grandma paragraph. um, So, And then I would just label the paragraphs and then remember the order of the paragraphs. And then because I like to, and like you were saying, like deviate and Mm -hmm. go go with how I feel like I want to tell the joke on that particular day. I am very bad at remembering specifically how I worded something one time. Mm-hmm. If it really was that good, my brain just remembers it naturally. Right. And I and then that comes out. So if I have to work at remembering the order, it's not going to work. Um, but so just memorizing the chunks of ideas in a row and then freestyling it makes me feel better. Also, I'm mm. very bad at rehearsing. I re- refuse in ah. fact, to rehearse. I, I, that might not be a good thing and we'll see how it goes, but <laughs> um, it's, I'm, it's a little scary that I'm starting with Toronto fringe, the one that kind of means the most to me. Mm. And I, I know everyone here and I'm inviting important people. And then I'm going to Saskatoon and Kelowna, which would have been great places to workshop this if fringes were in a different order. <laughs> no, Sorry, but they're not. I'm going to have to pause for one second. I have a visitor at the door. Okay. I think I heard somebody barking. Hi. Sorry about that. That's okay. It's the I liberals. Think I, the I liberals think I heard, are here. Oh, was it? I thought it was. I thought it, that's why the dog was barking. Yeah, I that understand. dog okay. barks every, every time someone comes into the hallway. It's lived here for two years and it hasn't figured it out yet. Is it going to be too bad on the recording? Not at all. That's okay. That's, <laughs> I, I like to I like to say that it's it's okay. Like I acknowledge we have to acknowledge that 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 we live in the world and and uh, people don't usually have their own studio, right? Which is soundproof and things like that. So. And normally, when I do voiceovers, I'm in the closet. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but but it's super uncomfortable. So your show your show, let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> just, to, just to use that as a segue. <laughs> yeah. um, 
tell me about tell me about let's be honest <laughs> okay. as we're talking about closets right exactly so basically it's just the story of my coming outs which are ongoing and plentiful and um you know at first it was the reactions were much more stressful and varied in a more negative way which later became very funny um especially since they were so different everybody had an Everyone who had a negative reaction had a unique and interesting negative reaction that now is very, very funny to me. And then as I moved on and got older, the reactions got a little bit more bizarre and less awful. And then even though to this day, people react all over the board. Um, mm. it, it, and it's mostly because they think I don't look, quote unquote, gay. Right. So that that th- there's a dissonance there. And, and you and I have talked about this before, but my mm. mother is still in that place where she... She just doesn't quite believe me. She she <laughs> she gets it. She's met my girlfriend. She is, as far as I know, accepting. But she just doesn't quite believe it. Because she had this idea of what gay people are. And she had an idea of what I am. And they just can't merge. She mm. won't. She won't. And um, so I don't know where that's going to lead us ultimately, but I mean, that's a fine place to be. I, I don't care if that's where she lives for the rest of her life. That's good. Um, so, and then there's this other thing in, that you and I have also talked about before is this shift, this paradigm shift in the way society sees gay people and queer people in general and how now it's almost like, who cares? You know, no, whatever you want. And it almost feels like we're being gaslit into thinking it was never a big deal when for a very long time, it was a very, very big deal. And that shift has been emotional to to experience that from the Mm. 90s through to present day, that crazy shift in the way we are perceived and the way we perceived ourselves. I think it took, I I was behind the times in some way of the way I see myself. And that lag had an emotional cost to it. And so now when I come out to people and there's almost no reaction, then I'm like, (laughs) well, yeah. And I don't know how to react when they Mm. react well. I'm almost expecting a dramatic reaction because that's what I've gotten for so long. And the dramatic reaction almost validates my emotions and experiences that predate that, you know, of, of coming out to myself yeah. over and over and over again. And now when people don't have a reaction, I'm like, well, you know, it was, it was hard. And um, uh, yeah. And I feel like I want to explain everything to them and they don't, they don't care. They don't want to know. They know, they know gay people. They have, they have, seven gay friends already and and it like becoming inconsequential is like wow that was a big shift from from me being 15 years old Mm. and absolutely locking down the thought of being gay i realized i had an attraction to a teacher of mine and i was so upset with myself that i completely locked down the thought and shoved it away for years and then i didn't come out to people until i was 23 Mm. There's this, this, that, you know, you talk about the, 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 the difference. Obviously there is still like, because people don't think you look gay, then there's still the need to come out. Right. It's like, all the time we're not, we're not at a, we're not quote unquote there until it doesn't matter that somebody, yeah. Yeah, they, they, that somebody doesn't have to wear the uniform. Yeah. The straight until proven gay. Right. Right. Yeah, and that that is co- continuing to come out is integral to my sense of identity, which I didn't realize. Again, this was another shift. I was single for a long, long, long time, and I, my family and my friends and the people around me, knowingly or unknowingly, kind of put me back in the closet because they were like, "If I wasn't constantly proving I was gay, then I was straight," you know, because right. it, it, the the assumption just kind of like went back to their original mm-hmm. feelings of me or right. ideas of me or strangers. Like strangers perceive me as straight. I'm always perceived as straight until and even when mm. I'm talking about my girlfriend, my girlfriend, my girlfriend. My right. girlfriend makes me breakfast. My girlfriend this, my girlfriend that. And people are like, you have great friends. And I'm, <laughs> <laughs> well, Is it the way I'm saying girlfriend? Like I don't know how to 
I don't know how to continue to move forward this conversation, but <laughs> these are not my friends. And so, yeah, it's really, I feel the need to continue to come out to people so that I feel good about myself. And I wonder if that will change in time. I, mm. I hope it does, but it being single and not being gay out loud was mm. very sad. It was sad. And I, and I, and I didn't like it and I didn't feel good. And I don't know if that's a society thing, if it's a me thing, or if that's something that could possibly change. Well, I mean, perhaps there's something about the fact of how hard you lock that down at 15. Yeah. Right. That now is like. Any kind of, any kind of lock in is like, no. Yeah. And I, yeah. 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 That's very true. What was, what was in terms of like coming out of the closet for yourself? What was that process? What, like, was there an instigating moment? Was it like, how did you, what was the determination if you'd locked it down so hard? Yeah, I, there were a couple. And like I said, I've keep coming out and I keep reinventing. Like I, I've gone through so many of the letters. It's, it's ridiculous at this point. Um, but the first the first realization was to myself at 15. And then two years later, I did sort of come out to my be- three of my best friends, one girl and two guys. And I, the my girlfriend, wh- wh- was her reaction was unmemorable in the way that she was accepting, which now thinking about it, I'm like, I don't know where she got that from, like where she learned to be accepting because she grew up the way I grew up. And she, she must have in the moment overcame it and went, oh, okay, good. But when I came out, then it felt more like a confession of like a weird kink. Like I was, I was saying I was bi, but really what I was saying was, or how it was received and what I felt was that I was saying I was straight, but I have this weird thing where I also think girls are really hot. You know, like <laughs> it, it, it felt like I was disclosing a sexual kink and right. my two guy friends reaction was very much in that vein where they were, where their reaction was like, Oh yeah. Like, Mm. and I thought, Oh, well, no, this isn't for me. I'm not going to keep telling people this. Like, and (laughs) and they were fine. I mean, it's not their fault. Again, they grew up in the same way that I did and they weren't trying to be gross, but it did irk me to be seen that way. And then I didn't tell anybody for another like six years where I just, and I also wasn't a practicing bisexual. I mm. didn't do anything. I just, and that's what made it really feel like it, this confession that it was very like, I know I shouldn't, but I'm a little bi. And, uh, and then I watched the Ellen DeGeneres' sitcom from the nineties, not her, st- not her talk show, her sitcom where she, she dated a girl and they were like, holding hands and they're sitting on a couch and they had dinner to gay, to mm. gay. <laughs> they did dinner together. And I was like, Oh my God, if that's gay, I am so gay. And that was, <laughs> that was the first time I was 23 years old. I was halfway through university mm. when I first saw a lesbian couple doing normal, like heterosexual things in a relationship that was mm. not based entirely on sex. And I was mm. like, oh, I'm so gay. And that that realization made me want to tell everybody I knew. I woke up the next day. I'm like, I'm telling everyone. And then I did. I went in a, on a, like a campaign to tell everybody. Because mm-hmm. as soon as I understood myself as not this like sexual deviant, which of course is what we've been taught religiously and otherwise for so long. As soon as I figured that out, I needed mm-hmm. to tell everybody because then, I, then all of a sudden, I was very proud of myself, and I was very, I was, I was very enlightened to think that I had love for other women, mm-hmm. not just, not just s- seeing them as sexual beings. It almost felt like I was being like, uh, like gross, you know, sexualizing women like that, yeah. you know, g- you know kind of playing into that the patriarchy of like aren't these people hot don't you want to do stuff with them like it it felt like i was playing into that at first and then i realized no it's love i love these people i want to cuddle with these people aren't they so soft <laughs> like those things are so much easier to identify with for me and to be proud of and then to tell everybody about and then i realized as i started telling people is that like no matter how i felt about it their feelings about it really were the way that it was reflected back to me. Um, Mm. So it didn't go totally great, but 
that's what compelled me to tell everybody is that I felt good about it and it, and it landed in me and being like, Oh yeah, it's about love. You know, the, the, you know, there's that, that, that attitude you described that, that came from the church. Um, I think you mentioned last time we talked about this, that you were raised Catholic. Mm-hmm. And of course it's, it's, it does happen in the Catholic church and it happens in a lot of other churches, that discussion about, about what gay means. And it, uh, that's one thing that I think, hasn't changed much. Yeah. And I still don't recall if I was ever taught explicitly that gay was bad only because I would not have called myself gay until I was 15. So I don't know if up until that point, anyone is actually explicitly saying things, but I internally knew it. So whether or not I heard it or it was just kind of known, uh, that's how I felt, you know? Yeah. And I think I, those things, those things are, are, are disseminated, um, not through lessons, but through attitudes and comments. Yeah. Until yeah. you get to be teenagers and then they start telling you, uh, you know, they start talking about abstinence and, and all of that other stuff. Uh, but it's never like when you, when they never tell children that it's just like, yeah. sort of just attitude and, and comments, right? But somehow I knew it was so bad that I couldn't even discuss it with myself. You know, like in my journal as a kid, I was addressing it as the problem. Mm. You know, I, so <clears throat> somehow, even without being explicitly told, or if I was, I don't remember it, I still had such a disdain mm. for myself, which was unusual because I, I thought I was great. You know, I was a child. What, you know, I had nothing really to compare myself to. I had, I didn't think I was immoral. I didn't think yeah. I was particularly moral either. But, you know, like I, there was, it what didn't come from like a life of self loathing. And this was just one more thing. This was like, the only thing I really detested and mm. was disgusted with. And it's like, how, how did I know that? How did I feel that? And it has mm. to have been the way I, was brought up either through the church or at home or yeah. school. I know I went to Catholic school. I went to Catholic high school, elementary mm-hmm. school and university, which was sort of a, a by accident. But, um, and, and I was, you know, singing in the choir. I was, I was very involved with the church mm-hmm. mostly because I was so bored in church that <laughs> there was like, I hear some other activities, but because I was in the choir and, uh, what are they called? Like altar girls. I had to then like rehearse those roles. So I was actually in church like more because I was so bored in church. I had to find an activity which right. required a rehearsal. So right. I was there a lot. Now you mentioned, I mean, this is not your first uh, uh, creation of your own work. Um, mm-hmm. Your your every silver every, every silver lining was like a musical that you created for Fringe twenty with twenty eighteen uh tw- uh twenty nineteen twenty nineteen what is time I always forget what is time, time. Is. what is time <laughs> um so you know there was that there was that that show and then um what what sort of inspired you to start working on a solo creation and and how do you feel about create, creating solo work right now? Yes. Thank you for asking that. Okay. So I started with this open, open, open. I think it's Cass Van Wick and another girl she works with whose name escapes me right now. I don't even know if they're still doing this, but mm. it was a juried, um, come test out your work, you know, sh- show us something you have. And I can't remember if I had already written it down or if I was just dabbling in stand up comedy where I was writing five minute sets. And then it, it came out, this, this stuff about coming out c- came out and I started putting it together, but I did a 10 minute version of this and, uh, there, it was juried with Derek Chua was one of the juror members. And at the end they give you feedback and he said, you should make this French show. And I was like, and then, you know, two weeks later, I was like, I'm going to make this a friend show. And and then I just started gathering point form thoughts and jokes in this big, long document. And then I, after Silver Lining, reapplied to Fringe and got it. And then that was two years ago. And this is, is carried over. And then you would think because I had so much time that I would have finished the script much earlier. No, no. Uh, it was only, I only finished it like last month. I had it in point form, um, for years, just sitting there ready to go. And, but I was worried about the ending. I was, I had it 
mostly finished and I was worried about the ending. And then I finally, I figured it out and I'm good. And so I'm very happy to do this. And now because of this, I've had this massive shift in the way I see my career. And I'm noticing that I admire more the people who have taken hold of their careers and figured out their mediums and then leaned into them, create their own work, get it on the stage, get it in the podcast, get it on Mm. YouTube. You know, like I'm really starting to think that's a viable option Mm. for me. And I'm caring less and less about the institution of the theater industry and more about what do I want to do and what showcases me in my best light. You know, because I go for auditions for ensemble roles and don't get them. But Mm. even if I did, it's like, is this the goal? Mm. Is the goal the word on my resume of the theater that I did or the festival that I worked for? Like, is, is that the goal just to get another theater on the resume? You know what I mean? And it, and it, at first it did seem like a lot of fun. And sometimes shows are fun being in the ensemble. Like Footloose was great. That's very fun to be in the ensemble, just dancing your life away. But I don't know, being on stage front and center in the way that you want to be seen, you know, you never really have that kind Mm. of creative control with another project because what are the odds that you're going to be cast in the exact role that shows off exactly what you want to show off right now in your life? And I've been mentored by this girl, Stephanie Moore and Robert, and she is a solo touring artist who has never auditioned for anything in her life. She has this brilliant niche because she lost an eye as a two-year-old to cancer. And so she has this great story of her life living with one eye. It's popping out all the time in gym and, you know, and she, she does this show where she takes out the eye and she, you know, has this projector that she's close up to. She like sings a little song with the eye socket. She glues her old eyes Mm. onto her face, making little puppets. It's hilarious. People sometimes faint, Um, but (laughs) (laughs) they're warned in advance. But so she has this entire thing. Her whole career has been based off of, first of all, touring the fringe circuit, getting buzz from there, moving on to independent theaters. She tours the schools. She is all over the world doing this, oh, getting grants, doing over and over and over again for at least 10 years. That's what she's done and completely self-sustained. And I thought I could definitely handle that mm. if people like the show. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, the the first off, I can tell you from my own experience that after performing my solo show, that shit's ad- addictive. Yeah. Right? I'm like, so glad to hear that. Like, I f- remember I finished my first run of the show at the Hamilton Fringe, and it was over, and I was like, when can I do this again? Yeah, sign me up again. Because, and- you know, you how often do you get the opportunity to, to have something you created to take people on a journey that you're taking them on, mm-hmm. and it's all just you, and maybe, you know... That's ego, but fuck, but come that on. high is high. Oh, it's a, it's a big when high. Somebody's gonna love it, you know. Yeah, somebody's gonna love your work. Somebody might not, but those people just leave, and you never hear from them again. You yeah. hear from the people who love your work, you know. Absolutely, and yeah. that just really jacks you up. And yeah. did you feel when you finished your first solo show that you wanted to write another solo show, or you wanted to do that same one again? Oh, I knew that I was going to write other solo shows. One hundred percent, I knew that that it was a medium that i was attracted to as far as like doing for fringe for show shows and stuff like that and and you know it's not the only thing i'm going to write and create but let's face it if you're doing fringe and you're doing a fringe tour there is a reason why people do a lot of solo shows on the fringe and that is because they're very easy to tour it's so easy to tour i'm by myself and and i have no i've almost no props no set and my technical cue my technical yeah cues are like lights on yeah lights off yeah that's it that's it two cues and so it's so easy i'm like uh fourth on the wait list for victoria fringe and i'm just waiting for like the day before fringe starts for them to be like we don't have we got a spot open and i'm like i'm here because i'm yeah. already in 
in Kelowna at the time. So I'll be, I'll be right there. I'm, I'm really like at the door of Victoria fringe um, <laughs> <laughs> because I really, I really want to do it. And um, I, right now from where I am, I think I want to tour this show maybe for a couple of years before mm. writing a whole new one. One of the things I am not good at as a writer is creating things from scratch. Mm. And it's something you have to practice, of yeah. course. But I'm really good at taking stories that have actually happened and then writing them into shows. That's mm. that's kind of my jam. Even Silver Lining was very much things that happened in mine and Ali's life. And mm. we just organized them into characters and then you know, set it to music. And so that's my skill. And I have some other stories to tell, but you know, an hour is a long time. And even putting together an hour of queer stuff is only possible because it's taken 15 years to live this yeah, and yeah. then 50 minutes to summarize it for an audience. So as it stands, I don't have an idea for something that's like, that I would create. Mm. However, I did apply to a residency in Georgia in the States, Ooh. which I'm a little nervous about being in the States, but that's another yeah, thing um, to, at the end of the fringe tour, because I mm. think I'm going to be a different person when I finish that tour, even though it's you only will- three destinations, but I'm still, I'm going to be different. Listen, it's every fringe tour is its own thing. And every fringe tour is a roller coaster. And every time you go to a new place, nothing that happened before matters. Right. Because yeah. you're in a new place and it's like you're hitting the reset button every time you show up. Mm-hmm. And you have to figure out what is this? Do the people at this fringe line up? Do they, is there, is it a flyer in culture or do they not like flyering? Yeah. Like you have to figure that stuff out fast. And you do because the people, the people will tell you. Um, like for example, Montreal, when I was there, they don't line up. They just show up in time for the show. <laughs> so you have to like, if you're going to fly or a show, you go for when the audience is coming out and you're sort of like running back and forth, trying to hand out flyers after a show. Yeah. It's, you have to figure out what works. And that's interesting. Cause this is the first time I'm hearing, Steph told me this like two weeks ago, but this is the first time I'm hearing of this flyering thing. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I totally miss. I missed that. I, I had oh. no idea that people did that. Apparently it's a big thing. And it's important. People, exactly. But the funny thing about doing silver lining is because the cast was like 13 people. Uh, marketing was not top of mind because with 13 people, you're naturally mm. going to draw a crowd because those people invite everyone they know. Yeah. And they come. We had a pretty solid run mm. both at fringe and next stage without really doing any marketing some but mm. very little now with the solo show that is my number one priority i'm getting buttons i'm getting fridge magnets i'm getting those little postcards with my face on it then the imaging is really important it mm-hmm. has to be my face it, what is this what's the like What's the visual I'm going for? Again, yeah. Steph has the eye. It's all about the eye. She has her eye in her hand. She has the eye on her forehead. She's got, you know, she it's the eye. All of her buttons, it's an eye. You know, it's that's such a such clear branding. What's yeah. mine? What am I doing? Okay, it, it can't be eyes. Steph has eyes. Uh, what is it? You know? Yeah. And so coming up with that and then literally standing in line at other shows, Steph was saying, pick, pick a top show at a, a certain venue and go. And you know, just- here's the, here's the problem with that. I saw this uh, one uh, year, the year I was on tour with uh, uh, one of the companies that I was involved with Keystone theater. We were touring across Canada. We were in Winnipeg and we were like, we are going to flyer at the Peter and Chris show. And so we were ready to go. We had our flyers in hand and we were walking towards the line for Peter and Chris. It's like opening day and they are, have a big line because they're a big draw. And we saw as we were approaching every single fringe artist descending on that line. And we thought we can't, we don't want to be just we can't another do one this of those to them. people. We can't do that to these people. And, you know, so it's like you have to, you want to hit as many lines as possible. You also need to be good to the people. Yeah. But, you know, I, it sort of leads into another thing that I wanted to talk to you about, because you mentioned to me that you're what you call an unexpected introvert. Yes. Yes. And I knew you would I, love that. <laughs> I have to tell you 
that flyering is the Horses. biggest challenge for me yes. when I go, yeah. when I'm doing stuff, because it takes so much for me to go to that line. Like if you yes. were to spot me before I go, I'm probably sitting just away from the group. I have my head between my knees <laughs> and I'm trying to breathe <laughs> and calm. It. And then I get up and I do it. But like, yes. it's hard for yeah. an introvert. That's why I refuse to get TikTok. I mean, it's part of it. Like the other advice I've been getting is, you know, TikTok your way through this tour. It finds your audience, you know, and, and, Go, go for it. It'll be interesting. And I just, I can't, I just can't, I cannot, mm. I can't. But even the flyering, like that is a imposing myself on people is so really hard. difficult. And I feel Absolutely. like even extroverts, but you know, some people are really good at that, but it's so but it's, hard for me to assume people want to talk to me or yeah. to bother them while they're it already is, doing something else. You know, I don't so- love to be bothered. Although I, sometimes I do. I don't mind. I, I mean, I like, I, I, the thing about me being introverted is more about my, I really, uh, what's that word? Like I, I, I heal and recharge yeah. mm-hmm. alone. Yes. I could, I need 90% alone time. Listen, <laughs> the, the, my whole plan like when I'm when I'm doing this to flyer, first off, I know my pitch yes. before like I've rehearsed my pitch. I know what that is before I go. You can't make that up on the fly. You're right. And then you hit the line, you do it, but you never do the line right before your show. OK, because you need that energy, especially as an introvert. So yeah. you're, you do you do the maybe the one before the one before your show, but don't go straight from a line to your show because you're already going to be drained. Right. And it, I, I want to think of the audience all as people I've never met. I don't know how this fits in, but I would much rather perform for strangers. Mm -hmm. I have this thought, like some secrets are better off told to strangers. Sure. It's, there's something about, this is why my family's not invited to the show and they're happy not to come um, for the exact same reason. (laughs) It's that it's too it's too hard to cater the show for the person, you know, in the audience, you know, and you know, you don't do it consciously, but if I knew my mom was in a certain performance, I would be doing the show with that in mind and, and changing the show as it's happening to acquiesce (laughs) to, to her and her needs. And I know that if I meet the people in line right before the show, that's enough for me to be like, wonder what that guy's thinking or like, you know, no, I I don't look at the people lining up for my show. Yeah, I would not. You know? I would be in the back by myself. You yeah, know, I just I, I just don't... need to I just need to not like I want to get into the venue before the line happens, or I want to be in a spot where yes. I don't have to see them and I can get in. I don't know necessarily who's there. Maybe I'll find out after this show. But it is there's so many things that you have to do to shield yourself, mm-hmm. and you know the fringe can be so social and so importantly social right that that you need to as an introvert you need to make sure that you build into every day the time you need in increments to recharge from each thing you do right and then force yourself as a solo artist to go out and do it because it's so important that that is, like I said, my number one challenge mm. is this marketing, getting out there, talking to everybody, tell people about the show, get them to the show, get them because the yeah. other nightmare is that no one's going to be there. And that's worse. The nightmare of talking to people or the nightmare of no one being at the show. Well, and if nobody's at the show, you don't make any money. Right. And, and I'm you know, putting that's... money into this. And it's so yeah. funny because like I said, there's no props. I don't need, I don't need anything for the show. And yet I I'm spending, I'm doing photo shoot after photo shoot. I'm doing like paying a graphic designer. I'm paying somebody Mm -hmm. to do the marketing. Mm -hmm. I'm paying for paid ads. Like it's very expensive to do a solo show on the marketing, the marketing aspect. But the marketing aspect is so important regardless. And a lot of times it's good that you were thinking about it now, because believe me, there are a lot of times, you know, I'm doing this podcast, you know, I, I, I get people approaching me to to talk about their show and they will approach me like two weeks, a week, three days before the fringe starts. And it is too late. It's too late. Yeah. It is too late. I don't, number one, I don't have time. I don't have time. And then also like, 
if you're just thinking about this now, you have not planned your marketing very well. It's so important to do what you're doing now and to be thinking about that. Yes. And I learned that from Fringe 2019 with Silver right. Lining is especially with Fringe, uh, Toronto Fringe, they back end everything very nicely, but I think they should warn people earlier. I think mm -hmm. at the beginning when you're accepted, they should say, hey, we really push you to get things done and you need to have your show written by February because in March, we're going to need answers, you know? And I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some of the best advice that I got when I was, I was on the tour. Anyway. I was, I was, when I was out East, I was doing a couple of maritime fringes and, uh, uh, the artist, uh, uh Jillian English, uh, who doesn't really do Toronto fringe anymore, oh, but she's oh, a brilliant yeah. performer. And she, she, one of the first things that she said is as soon when I create a show before I write a word, I think about how my, my market that show, mm. can I invent a, a strong image? And I don't necessarily do it right before I write the show, but as soon as I'm done, I'm thinking about the image. Yeah. It's so important to, to have that early yeah. so that, you and know, the show needs don't... to be finished. Maybe there are a few exceptions, but mm. the show in my, for good, especially not even just marketing, because I guess you could come up with some strong images, but mm -hmm. I needed to know how the show ended yeah. to know what the show was about. What's sure. the through line? What is the main of this piece? Because I go all over the place because it's 50 yeah. minutes. I, I talk about a lot of different aspects of queer culture and shift and all that stuff and myself and dating and blah, blah, blah. What is the thing? And without knowing the thing, how could I come up with the like the tagline? How could I yeah. come up with the pitch if I didn't know what I was resolving in the show? And so I I knew from two years ago from Silver Lining that I needed to finish the script before any of that was done. Yeah. And even though the script is finished, I still don't know how long it is. They again today they asked me. Yeah. It's April 25th. It's not until July 6th, but today they said, how long is the show? And I was like, I, I don't know. And it's finished. And also I know there are people out there who don't have their show finished. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that there are you know, a lot of fringes, they'll do that. And they need, that's partially to help them with scheduling. And also because they got to get their program to the printers earlier than mm -hmm. we all think, yeah. right? Yeah. It's so insane. We yeah. don't think about those sorts of things. The image was due today, you know, and yeah. I was thrown off which was irritating to me because I had two years to plan and I knew this was going to be a problem. And when the form came out three weeks ago, I was like, I don't have time. And I panicked. And anyway, the image turned out fine. But I learned a lot from doing that image. Like that's not the one I would put on a poster because it's a square. Mm -hmm. The program photo, which is due first, is a tiny little square. So yeah. you want a one big image as the the thing the photo and then you want it to be square then it's like if you get an ad sometimes the ad is like the last third of the page mm -hmm. and it's horizontal so now you need a photo that's horizontal you also you know um for the digital ads for instagram for the poster that's a piece of paper like the portrait that's a different photo yeah and then they also should be like themed in a way that when people see them they know it's the same show yeah because there's that I don't know what to call it, like a strategy of people need to see things like three times before they decide to act on it. Yeah. And so it's like, it has to be cohesive enough that people are picking up that it's the same thing. So yeah. the first image you do is important because it's setting a tone for the others, but it's, it's never just one picture. You're not taking one picture and using it for the whole thing. And in fact, that's very boring. We did that for silver lining where we had one good image and it's like, we could have used five, five yeah. different orientations and, and different images following the same theme to use yeah. because every time a review came out, we'd use the same picture on Facebook to talk about the review, you know? Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, that's, that's kind of boring because people are looking at the picture like, oh, I already saw that picture. Yeah. They're not noticing that the, that the content is different. It also makes it also makes it difficult, like on Instagram, to have um, to just see this essentially the same picture over and over. Yeah, so you need that variation. Yeah, um, otherwise it's boring. And then if I'm doing a tour and I'm using mm -hmm. my personal Instagram, I can't do that to the people 
following me generously is yeah. give them the same photo over and over and over again. And yeah. so I've decided to pack photo shoots as an ongoing thing mm -hmm. where I'm just constantly doing photo shoots so that I have different images. It'll be nice when I'm on tour. And then it'll also be nice when I have some video footage from my first show at fringe mm -hmm. to then mm -hmm. use as like little clips or stills and things like that. Like you have to be generating this new and interesting content even if all you're saying in the comments is like, come see my show, you know, it needs to still be ongoing and evolving. Yeah. Otherwise people are, they're checking out. Well, that's, that's the thing is, is, you know, if we're using, if we're using something, if we're using social media to promote our show, we have to present people with something new to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a whole, you know, I'm just not good at that. I'm not a visual artist. I'm not a graphic designer. I have no idea how to use Photoshop, Adobe. I don't know any of it. I don't even know what programs are what. And it's hmm. a huge hole in my, I guess, in my artistic career, but it's like, you can't do everything. I'm already a dancer, singer, actor, aerialist, <laughs> writer, producer. What more do you want? But yeah. they want, if you want to succeed, you have to do all these things or hire somebody else. And, yeah. and find that person early and vet them for their style. You know, my yeah. girlfriend is a graphic designer, but she designs logos like mm -hmm. her, her, her style is very clean and crisp and monochromatic even and very, very clean. But that's not what I need for my posters. So right. when I tried to rely on her, it was frustrating. And I was like, no, no. Can you make it like? Zah! And she's like, no, um, I can make it more like the <laughs> Nike logo, <laughs> but I cannot, you know, and so you have to find a graphic designer that you trust to build your image if you're yeah. not going to do it. And I don't yeah. like giving other people that kind of power because uh, it, it means everything. It's everything. That image, yeah. the colors you use, the, the, the everything, it tells such a, a big story all at once to the viewer. And that person better nail it. Yeah. And then so absolutely. it's your job to find that person and spend the time working with different people, asking them all to do the same task, paying them all to do it, and then choosing which one. It sounds crazy, but it the image is so important. It absolutely is. You know, it's it's funny because you yourself. know, you mentioned you mentioned the program, you know, getting that program image. Yes. I think a lot of times people don't know how important the program image is. Yeah. Because you know, if when when an audience, a potential audience member is flipping through the program, what's the first thing that's going to draw their attention? It's the image. It's the image. And they're making their entire decision based off that image because yeah. no, no log lines or tag lines are really that good. The more interesting the show, the more wishy-washy the log line is, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a, a very boring but plot heavy show can have a really interesting log line. Mm -hmm. And so people, when they read those, they're like, ah, okay, it's the picture. They're falling yeah. in love with the picture. Does that look interesting to them? Yeah. I mean, part of the issue is that a lot of times, you know, you can sort of see people and they, you can tell that the day that the deadline fell, <laughs> they yeah. found some clip art or yeah, something. It's and it's like for silver lining, we, the photo is of our graphic designer. It's an right. old photo she had. And we were like, okay, yeah, slap it on. It has nothing mm. to do with the show. <laughs> it, it, nothing whatsoever. And and again, it ended up being fine. But it was not fine stress-wise to have that photo. That photo is still out there. And every time I look at it, I'm like, I don't even remember that girl's name. And she, <laughs> she is the first face of silver every silver line. Right. That's the other thing is people, you have to keep in mind that the images you put out there are the first experience that anybody has of that show. Yeah. And then we asked the audience, oh, forget about that girl. It's actually us, you know? And <laughs> it, 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 I'm sure it caused like this, un, like unnoticed, we didn't notice what kind yeah. of a, a negative effect that had because we can't know who would have been attracted to the show more if we had consistent marketing. We'd never yeah. know. We, we won't know who we lost in that transition. Very true. Yeah, not to scare anybody, but no. But I mean, it's, is this so is the thing: is that is is you know, as as a fringe artist, and you're on tour, and when you're on tour on your own, it is you're flying by the seat of your pants. Yeah, right. You are 
And you really rely on those connections that you make from city to city. So you, you know, you, you do, let's say, for example, you're doing, uh, uh, you've got, uh, uh, say Sa- uh, Saskatoon after Toronto. Yeah. And so the people that you see in Saskatoon, when you get to Kelowna, you are hopeful. You're like suddenly going to be like, Oh, f- there's a familiar face. Like those are the connections that you're going to yes. be leaning on. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I'm hoping this year was almost a surprise. I, and there's no calf lottery this year. So I've gotten into these uh, fringes individually, which has been amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would like to fill in the schedule even more heavily, you know, yeah. f- fill in every stop along the way from the East coast to the West coast with fringes and yeah. then see who else is doing it. That's the thing I'm looking most forward to meeting people in Saskatoon and Kelowna, who else is touring and yeah. how long have you been doing it? How many stops are you making? How do you, well, you know, what mistakes are common and um, <clears throat> just, you know, getting into that community. I, from what I hear from Steph is there's a large touring fringe community that that's what they do. Yeah. You will, around there, and around you and know, around. The thing is that once you're in, once you, you, once you're there, there's, there are a lot of fringe artists who don't do Toronto. Yes. And so they, their fringe starts in Winnipeg and they go. Right. Because they're at the same time, uh, Winnipeg and Toronto. Winnipeg follows Toronto. This year, I think they're at the exact same time with, or or with an overlap that if you do both, you could like back end one and front end the other. Right. A lot of in, in past years, they've they've followed each other, but a lot of people don't do Toronto. Yes, I've um, heard they've that. they've found for a lot of fringe for a lot of touring artists, um, they find it hostile for people who's not who are not from here. Yeah. I've other fringes, other fringes are more friendly. So they start there, but you will see things that you've never seen. Yes. And it's fascinating. I can't wait. I can't yeah. wait. I, I think Saskatoon especially is a very community oriented um, festival and the way that they structure it, you know, in, in a certain part of town and with mm-hmm. a lot of buzz. Like, I'm very excited to see what that is like. Kelowna, I think, is very new, their fringe. And yeah. but that offers an opportunity as well to be one of the first years of people and start to kind of what could this look like and, you know, yeah. be a part of something like that. And um, it, it would be, it's it's really interesting to me to see what the difference between Saskatoon and Toronto is going to be. I know I'm glad that I live in this city and that all of my connections are here. This is more mm-hmm. of a industry show. Mm-hmm. And then when I get to Saskatoon, it's like, oh, woo-hoo! you know, it's, yeah. I really feel like I'm just going to let it all go. And, and that's where I'm going to become this new person I'm hoping to be. What do you, what are your plans? Are you af- between Saskatoon and Kelowna? Are you coming back to Toronto and then going out to Kelowna? Or are you? No, what, I'm using this as an opportunity to car camp across nice. the country. So Very nice. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be perfect. I have 10 days to get to Saskatoon from Toronto Fringe. Um, so I'll just hang out in Manitoba a little bit and so on and do a little bit of Saskatoon. And then I'm going to slowly meander. I'm going to go to Vancouver Island. There's Nanaimo Fringe and Victoria Fringe, with I, which mm-hmm. I both have applied for. I am 13th on the Nanaimo, the Nanaimo Fringe. <laughs> so I'm not getting in. Um, it's the last place um, possible, <laughs> but I will be there. And then heading back towards Kelowna. Mm. And then I'm going down the the coast, um, the West coast, and then maybe across America. Again, I'm still quite nervous about going yeah, across the state right now. There. Um, but I also don't think I can mentally handle driving the exact same route all the way back home. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see. No, but I mean, there, you can always take slightly different routes, but, um, one thing I'd love, I'd love to do, Laura, is, um, since you are getting ready for a tour and you're going to be traveling, I'd love to do, either some minis, mini-sodes or uh, maybe some Instagram live streams or something where yes, you, we can, yeah. we can talk about how the fringe is. I'd love to, to, to revisit this as a, as, as you as a touring artist sort of finding fringe as you go. Yes. I would love that. I think it's going to be just a, a completely new experience. And I'm hoping also to get into Vancouver fringe, which is after Kelowna. Uh, the, that lottery is like May 6th. So oh. that would be cool too, just to really wrap it all up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, for talking with me today. This has been great. And I look forward to uh, uh, seeing how the fringe goes. Yes. Thank you so much. 